Honorable Senators, we have a quorum. I declare this meeting in session. Now, uh, welcome to this meeting of the Standing Senate Committee of National Security, Defense, and Veterans Affairs. Uh, my name is uh, Senator Jean-Guy Dagenet, Deputy Chair of the Committee. I am joined today by my fellow committee members, whom I welcome to introduce themselves, beginning on my right. Senator Pierre-Hugues Boisvenu, uh, District La Salle, Quebec. Senator Dave Richards from New Brunswick. Peter Beam, Ontario. Andrew Cardozo from Ontario. Thank you. And we, we will have Senator Desco. Now, for those uh, watching the session, we are continuing our study of Bill C-21 and hack to amend certain hacks and to make certain consequential amendments, firearms. In our first panel, we have the pleasure to welcoming at a video conference, le Dr. Mark Senior, Professor Associate. Dr. Mark Senior, Associate Professor and Psychiatrist, Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center, University of Toronto. And with us in the room from Statistics Canada and the Canadian Center for Justice Statistics and Community Safety, we have Jose B. Bijan, Assistant Chief Statistician, Social Health and Labor Statistics. And we have Lucy Leonard, Director of the Canadian Center for Justice Statistics and Community Safety. Welcome. We are ready to hear your preliminary remarks. This will be followed by questions from senators. Let me remind you that you have five minutes for your opening remarks. With uh, Mr. Mark Senior. Uh, good morning, committee members. It's an honor to be with you today. My name is Dr. Mark Senior. I am an associate professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto and a psychiatrist at Sunnybrook Health Sciences Center. I am a suicide prevention researcher and have published more than 100 scientific papers on suicide, mainly focused on population level strategies for preventing suicide, such as means restriction. I'm a former vice president of the board of the Canadian Association for Suicide Prevention. I'm lead author of the Canadian Psychiatric Association Guidelines for Responsible Media Reporting. I am also the America's lead for the International Association for Suicide Prevention's Partnerships for Life Initiative, which aims to promote national suicide prevention strategies. I'm here today to tell you that legislative efforts aimed at reducing access to firearms are a necessary component of comprehensive suicide prevention in Canada. Suicidal behaviors are complex by their very nature and are influenced. Uh, Dr. Senior, uh, can you speak slowly for the translation, please? Uh, okay, I will slow Thank down. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. Suicidal behaviors are complex by their very nature and are influenced by a myriad of factors. In many cases, decisions to die by suicide are made impulsively, often with ambivalence about dying and or following a short-term crisis that transiently alters a vulnerable person's sense of perspective and ability to think rationally. One of the most reproducible findings in suicide research is that having lethal means at hand in the home confers greater risk of death in these situations. As clinicians and researchers, we work tirelessly to remove such means to buy precious time for the crisis to pass and to allow a person to reflect, reconsider, and seek help. Some of the earliest work in suicide research showed that detoxification of household gases and automobile emissions had the fortuitous effect of reducing overall suicide rates in multiple countries. The notion that restricting access to the means of suicide saves lives is not controversial among suicide prevention experts, and countries all around the world are implementing means restriction interventions. Arguably, the most important review of suicide prevention studies in the past decade concluded that, quote, there is now strong evidence that restricting access to lethal means is associated with a decrease in suicide and that substitution to other methods appears to be limited. The World Health Organization's Live Life Implementation Guide for Suicide Prevention in Countries lists means restriction, including restriction of access to firearms, as the first of four key interventions, describing it as, quote, a universal evidence-based intervention for suicide prevention. 
the notion that means restriction strategies, quote, don't work is myth number six in the Mayo Clinic's list of myths about suicide. One of the problems of population-based research is that it involves large uncontrolled experiments. I know this intimately. The first suicide-related study I published showed that a means restriction intervention in Toronto apparently did not work because people substituted one suicide location for another. I have spent the past two decades examining the data more closely and proving that the intervention did work, but that this was initially obscured by other factors. The complex, uncontrolled nature of these observations is why we must be very cautious in interpreting findings from analyses focused on firearm legislation and suicide in Canada. Some researchers have concluded that a reduction in firearm suicides with no change in overall suicide rates is an indication that legislation does not work, but this conclusion is only correct if suicide rates would otherwise have been stable in recent decades, and this is not a good assumption. Let's not miss the forest for the trees. From 1981 to 2008, the age standardized suicide rate in Canada fell by about 33%, a huge change that has been roughly stable since. This coincided with a precipitous decline in firearm suicides. In the US, the overall suicide rate has increased by 37% over the past two decades. What accounts for the difference? Clearly differences in firearm legislation and availability between our countries have played a major role. This conclusion is further supported by evidence from controlled trials, for example, where US states which restrict access to firearms are compared to those without restrictions. 48 out of 49 or 98% of such studies found that restricting access to firearms led to fewer suicides overall. The authors conclude restricting access to the most available and lethal means of suicide, such as firearms, lowered suicide rates using the restricted method and lowered overall suicide rates when the method was sufficiently widely used. In conclusion, there is broad evidence from multiple sources that means restriction, including restricting access to firearms, is an effective component of an evidence-based strategy for prevention. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Senior. Maintenant uh, pour statistique. Now for Statistics Canada, I understand that Mr. Jose Bejin will be presenting opening remarks. You have the floor, Madam. Thank you. Honorable Chair, members of the committee, I would like to thank you for the opportunity to present our most recent statistics on firearm-related violent crime in Canada. The information that I will be focusing on today is based on data from two surveys. The Uniform Crime Reporting Survey, which collects detailed information on criminal offenses that come to the attention of police from more than 600 police services across Canada. The second source is the Homicide Survey. It collects more detailed information specifically regarding homicides. In 2022, police reported crime included including violent crime, increased for a second consecutive year after it decreased during the first year of the pandemic. Prior to the pandemic, violent crime had been on the rise for five years. The Violent Crime Severity Index in 2022 was the highest since 2007. Firearm-related violent crime accounted for less than 3% of police-reported violent crime. The rate of firearm-related crime per 100,000 population increased from 2013 through 2019. Between 2009 and 2013, the national rate had actually decreased. In 2022, according to police reported data, young men between the ages of 12 and 17 were most often the accused person involved in firearm violent crime with 111 accused youth per 100,000 population. This rate was 47% 40 higher than 10 years earlier. Young men aged 18 to 24 followed with a rate of 101 per 100,000 population, an increase of 4% from 2012. We are aware of the concern about the use of firearms in cases of domestic violence. According to our most recent data, about 1.2% of victims of intimate partner violent crime were involved in firearm-related incidents. 
when considering intimate partner violence incidents involving female victims, the proportion of firearm-related violence was higher at 1.3% relative to male victims at 0.6%. In 2022, there were about 14,000 incidents of firearm-related violent crimes, or 36.7 incidents per 100,000 population. This rate was 9% higher than in 2021, and this increase was mainly driven by increases in Ontario at 24%, New Brunswick at 24%, and British Columbia at 12%. Overall, firearm-related violent crime rates were higher in northern areas of the provinces, especially rural areas in the north and in the territories. Rates were also higher in the prairie provinces, with the highest provincial rate occurring in Saskatchewan. In 2022, 62% of the firearm-related violent crime in urban areas in the south involved handguns. In rural areas in the south, one-third of firearm violent crimes involved a rifle or shotgun, however, 36% involved a firearm-like weapon or an unknown type of firearm. In 2022, handguns were the most common firearm present in Toronto at 83% of firearm-related violent crime, Ottawa at 70%, and Hamilton at 70%. Since firearm violent crime reached a low in 2013, the rate of handgun crime increased by 50%, while crimes involving a shotgun or rifle increased by 45%, and crimes involving a sawed-off or fully automatic gun increased by 35%. However, the largest increase, at 76%, was seen in the firearm-like weapon or type unknown category. And this category includes, for example, pellet guns, flare guns, BB guns, starters, pistols, and 3D guns. It also includes incidents where the police could not identify the type of gun that was present. The national homicide rate increased by 8% in 2022, marking the fourth consecutive annual increase. In 2022, police reported 874 homicides, 343 were committed with a firearm, 45 more than in 2021. The rate of firearm-related homicides was, has generally been increasing over the last nine years. Since the mid-80s, the proportion of homicides perpetrated with a firearm was relatively smaller to that perpetrated with a knife or other cutting instrument. Since 2016, firearms are the most common method to commit a homicide. In 2022, almost half of firearm-related homicides were related to gang activity compared to 7% of homicides that did not involve a firearm. In closing, Statistics Canada recognizes there are information gaps and continues to work with a broad range of justice and public safety partners to identify and address information needs and priorities. Thank you, Mr. Chair, for your attention today, and we'd be happy to answer any questions. Thank you very much, Madame Bégin, for your presentation. The question, je tiens à souligner la présence du Sénateur Plett, qui s'est joint à nous. Senator Plett is joining us. With us today until 12.30 p.m., we will do our best to hollow time for each member to ask a question. With this in mind, four minutes will be hollowed for each question, including the answer. Évidemment, je brandirai cette carte pour vous aider. I will raise this card to show you that you have 30 seconds led, uh, left. Please ask succinct questions and indicate to who you are asking your questions. Senator Cardozo and followed by Senator Boisvenu. Thank you. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. My, my question is really directed to Madame Bégin. 
but uh, the other witnesses may wish to respond as well. Um, in the brief that Statistics Canada presented to us, you indicated that the rate of firearm-related violence has generally increased over the past several years, and you mentioned that in your, in your statement just now as well. And while firearm-related violent crime typically represents less than 3 percent of police-reported violent crime in the country, you indicated that it has a significant emotional and physical impact on victims, families, and communities. To what extent do you think, and is it sort of statistically possible even to do a projection here, but to what extent do you think would the implementation of Bill C-21 help to reduce the physical and emotional impacts of firearm-related violence in Canada? And also, I'd be very interested to know how does StatsCan define emotional impact? Uh, thank you for, for the question. So, uh, as, as I understood, like two parts in terms of uh, the overall uh, increase in uh, firearm related violent crime. So, what we've seen in terms of since 2013, uh, the, the, the large increase, there's been some fluctuation for one year firearm related violence, but overall, we mentioned uh, a large uh, increase uh, in firearm. Uh, incident, and it's mo mainly the largest increase we see for firearm like weapon or known type of firearm. So we're not sure if that's the ghost gun or, but this is where the largest increase is of 76 percent. And this could partially be a result of the increase in, in those incidents of fire like weapon or unknown type of firearm. It could also be the result of the increase in the rate of youth accused uh, of firearm-related violent crime that we see uh, a major increase uh, over the past uh, decade of more than 40 percent for uh, youth under the age of uh, 18. It could also be um, accounting for uh, that those firearm-like weapon or known type are also counting for a l relatively large proportion of this crime, which was not there before as well, the ghost gun that had been discussed on this committee as well. The issue that we have in terms of some of the limitation of the data on this uh, increase of firearm is the UCR, the Uniform Crime Report Survey, where uh, all police services in Canada report does not allow for distinction between all of these firearm-like weapons uh, whether it's the pellet, the ghost gun, uh, uh, or the 3D gun. And uh, that's why, given the largest increase in this category, for us, it is unlikely uh, that it is uh, this type of weapon are contributing uh, to most of this increase. So again, we cannot for sure uh, mention uh, where the increase comes, but in terms of this type of firearm, uh, this is the largest increase we've seen since uh, 2013. Uh, and thank, then, thank you. I'm sorry yeah, to interrupt okay. you because uh, I know the clock is, uh, okay. is ticking. But do you have um, a definition or what is the threshold of emotional impact? Oh, that I don't think it's something we measure in the sense of, uh, of the data. Uh, but what we see with this bill is uh, in terms of better protection of victim, especially in the escalation. Uh, for example, I think it's in the protection order. So in terms of the emotional impact, I think it's to stop a bit, uh, ideally, the arm to the victim. But at the same time, if this bill is able to uh, limit the access, of course, of firearm for individuals that, uh, that are demonstrating instability or at risk of, of causing harm to victim, uh, this is where uh, us, we understand, uh, us also working with victim and doing also uh, uh, victimization survey at Statistic Canada, having worked very closely with many victim organizations, that uh, those uh, additional protection that the bill is adding to, uh, uh, you know, uh, incident of domestic violence, this is where uh, it could uh, then maybe deal with some of the emotional impact if it reduces the arm and the violence against the victim, especially of uh, intimate partner violence. Okay. Thank you, Madame Leona. Small correction. Senator Boisvenu will be asking the next question. Thank you very much, Mr. Chair. Welcome, witnesses. Indeed, it is really concerning to see that between 1980, I could go further back up to 1990, there was a constant drop in the number of 
homicides committed with firearms. And since the beginning of 2000, there's been a significant rise. During that period, let's see the last 10 years, did you study the main factors that account to the increase in firearms uh, crime? The main factors that are related to firearms related incidents. Well, I understand that if we have a bill that seeks to reduce crime, we need to know the underlying factors. Answer, yes. That's what was said in this committee. We are not claiming to have all the reasons to explain the cause of the violence. Something that was mentioned was, for example, better control of firearms. What we've seen from the data collected, if we are talking about a strict firearms control system in firearms, information is not necessarily available. About 3% of firearms-related incidents, about 5% domestic violence. Can we really say, looking at all these figures, that we are controlling firearms? We are saying that we are controlling firearms, but if we look at the situation that has obtained over the past few years, statistics have shown that this is increasing. Witnesses that came here, be it those from the RCMP, the border services, have said that this is an alarming situation when we see the weapons that are circulating, like the 3D guns. The Toronto Police Service that came to testify said that since the entry into force of C-75, they, they, they were over, overlooking the general policy in terms of drugs. Help me with figures. They believe that there's a link between deregulation and with this law, almost 20% of murders were committed by people who had been freed because of C-75. So do you have any data on that to establish a correlation between government policies and the increasing number of crimes? Those are the issues we are detecting from our work. There's the issue of tracking and the origin of firearms. You've talked about factors, but we also need to have the best data, which we do not necessarily have now, to be able to establish the correlation. Well, that's the work we want to do with the Canadian Association of Chiefs of Police. We want to have the best tools for identifying police incidents, individual identifications, Statistics Canada would like to have more socioeconomic data, integrate all that data, and be able to track all those people who purchase firearms and use them to injure people. Question, do you have any data related to the use of illegal or unregistered firearms related to crimes? Well, looking at our data, in cases where there's domestic violence, in 88% of those cases, people did not have licenses, so the weapons were illegal, and that is in the brief. But, Madam, the time is limited, Madam Leona. Maybe you could send us, uh, in writing, any other information you may have. Is there a date by which the information should be sent by, in writing? Well, maybe by Friday you should send us information. Senator Cardozo, followed by Senator Youssef. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <clears throat> My first question is for Mr. Senor, and I wonder if you could um, um, give us any more information about some of these, some of the details, and I think you might have covered it. <clears throat> could you tell us the degree to which, in, when we're looking at, su at suicides, the percentage of suicides that involve firearms versus those that do not involve firearms. I'm not interested in the detail of those, but just if you have firearms versus non-firearms. And whether you have information on whether 
whether people are using um, handguns or long guns or whether you know whether they're legal guns or illegal guns. Uh, thank you, Senator. Um, in terms of the proportion by firearm, it's dropped substantially. Um, so in, in 1980, um, it was about a third of all deaths in Canada that were by firearms. Um, now the latest statistic that I've seen is 16%. So it's about half of what it was. Um, and um, in terms of which sorts of guns are used, actually, I don't have that information. Forgive me. Okay. No, that's fine. Thank you. Um, and uh, to our other witnesses, uh, Madame Bege and Madame Leonard, um, in ter I wonder if you have uh, information on domestic assault. So we've had uh, some very compelling testimony from women's groups and organizations that deal with uh, domestic and intimate partner uh, violence who are very uh, supportive of this bill. Um, they talked about um, domestic violence happening just as much in rural areas as it does in in, uh, in urban areas. I wonder if you have any information on uh, any stats in terms of um, the degree to which firearms are used in domestic violence in urban centers versus the rural areas. Yeah, that's, that's my question. Okay. So uh, in, in terms of the exact split, so that we could come back, uh, what we know for the um, intimate partner violence that we do collect in the uniform crime uh, reporting is that usually it's not an isolated incident. There is a progression, and that's what the data have shown. And uh, the uh, introduction, for example, of this bill or some of the suggestion to bring civil or emergency protection order uh, in the case of intimate partner violence, this is where it would, uh, for us, like we see that in the call for services uh, that the police receive, then that the uh, data could be collected to then maybe prevent the escalation. Because often when we see in the case of the homicide, often whether it's so St. Marie or other, we've seen recently that the offenders often had prior in domestic violence, but the information is not collected in a timely manner. So that's why the civil or emergency protection order, if the information is well integrated, then it would prevent the escalation and maybe some of the lethal violence that has been there. Because that's what one of many of the witnesses have raised here as well, is that uh, the firearm related issue, uh, we need to have better information and better sharing of information to prevent the escalation. Okay, and in that context of the escalation, if I have 30 seconds, um, the use of the firearm is also a threat as opposed to not just necessarily being used and shot, that the very presence of a firearm becomes an, an object of, of a threat. Absolutely. And we know it's been mentioned as well here, the, the, the statistic that when there is the presence of firearm in the household that for the women, they are five times more likely to then, uh, you know, that there be lethal violence. But this statistic is from the U.S. Here in Canada, uh, it's been said often that the presence of firearm does increase the lethal violence. But in terms of the exact statistic, we, we don't we don't have the same assessment that it's five times. But we know there's more likelihood that when there's a presence of firearm in the household, that then there would be more lethality. Uh, mm. of uh, for next senator senator Yusuf, followed by senator richards and followed by senator plett uh, thank you chair and uh, uh, thank you witnesses uh, for being here um i guess my first question is to um dr senor in regard to suicide prevention and um the challenge that we face as a society in general around suicide um just in the context of education around uh, use of firearms and people getting licenses, is there anything in terms of your research and uh, knowledge that you think we can do to better enhance how we can prevent um, a suicide uh, in the context of trying to educate those who are uh, trying to obtain a firearm or trying to gain um, a license? 
Thank you so much for that question, Senator. It's actually quite a complicated question. And the reason for it is that if you think of probably the two biggest population level strategies for suicide prevention, one of them is restricting access to means, that's limiting access like firearms, but the other one is decreasing cognitive availability, like not educating people about how to end their lives. You want to educate people about how to seek help if they're in a crisis, how to manage that situation. And so it's very tricky when you're educating someone about a suicide method. Um, you might have very good intentions and say, well, listen, this is a common suicide method and you know, here's how to avoid it. And that might have some benefits, but you're also telling the person that they're obtaining something that can be used for suicide when that might not be on their mind. Um, and so that actually confers a bit of harm. That would have to be done very, very cautiously. I think um, probably the best advice that I could give is you want to focus on just having fewer firearms. That's probably the most important thing. Um, but for those people who have it, just really working hard on safety, um, especially just, you know, that they're not... The thing that really confers risk is having a method of death in the home easily accessible. And so any steps that one could take to decrease the accessibility of it. And in fact, you might want to focus because of that concern um, on, on accidental deaths, saying, look, we heaven forbid that your child or someone should get access to this. We have to make sure that it's absolutely carefully protected. Um, and then, of course, that would have the ancillary benefit of being harder to access for someone for the use of suicide. Uh, thank you. And if I may, uh, uh, both uh, Ms. Leonard and Ms. Behan, I mean, data collection is very important for us to understand what we're dealing with, but more importantly, how we can use the data to better shape public policy so in that regard, I guess, um, without presupposes what uh, better method we should be using, but just based on what you have presented, how can we better assist you in the context of the data that you collect and are disseminating that will help us in terms of crafting better public policy? Because there seems to be a big gap between what you're presenting and the granular detail that could better assist us uh, specifically because this is at the source. If the police are not collecting it, police chiefs still have a consistent way of how we approach this across the country. We're not learning very much. Because we're learning some things, but we're, there's a big gap in between. And of course, public policy is to try to figure out how to fill that gap. So maybe you can uh, share some thoughts with us that may help us reflect as we get to deal with this bill at the, at the committee stage. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So it's uh, that is a very good question, and, and also I like the premise uh, as well uh, at the end of your question that uh, we, we do have to say we, we do have great collaboration uh, and recognizing that it is complex to, to measure firearm uh, uh, in, in Canada and, and, and beyond. But uh, in terms of the work we've done to date, especially with public safety and our CMP, it's really uh, at some point uh, it was that's it the collaboration to try to establish a better framework for the collection of this uh, uh, firearm uh, enforcement and uh, via horizontal coordination. So uh, we've been involved uh, with uh, with funding from public safety uh, to try uh, to pilot a feasibility study on uh, trying to assess the uh, how to collect the origin of gun crime. So we've done this work, it was piloted, there was recommendation done, and, and how to better uh, capture the data, and how it would be done is to, uh, again, standardize some definition. Yes. Richards, followed by Senator Plett and Senator Desco. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman, and, and thank you, witnesses, for being here. Um, my, my question and observation is to uh, Professor Sanger. Um, the last four people I knew who, uh, who took their own lives, two was from asphyxiation, and the other two were from medical assistance, because suicide is now legal. Um, most of the people I know who hunt are extremely safety conscious and extremely aware of the potential of the of what harm rifles can do. Uh, and I haven't been into a house yet who has a, a person who has a rifle who doesn't have a, a locked and contained gun cabinet. So I'm wondering how would this bill help prevent suicides better than that? And since we don't know the temperament or 
the, you know, or, or when someone will become so depressed and so utterly, um, you know, utterly devastated by life that he's going to take his or her own life. How do we know uh, when this will happen? We don't know when this will happen. So, I mean, I, I'm not sure if regulating firearms is going to help any more than uh, finally banning all firearms. So maybe you could, could answer that for me. I see. Uh, th thank you so much, Senator. It's a, it's a good question. My condolences on, on your losses. Um, I, I think, um, you, in a way, you answered the question at the end there, which is that we don't know. And, and that is, um, you know, just to maybe contrast Canada with the United States, that's one of the main problems that they, we run into in the United States when I speak to colleagues is that um, they can't restrict access and prevent access to firearms there. And so they focus on trying to detect when someone is depressed um, or when might be at risk. But that strategy is has not, I mean, it has some success, but it's much, much less successful than just having no guns. Um, the way to protect against suicide is to have the minimum amount of guns available. Um, and so I guess the, the best answer that I can give you is, um, you know, within, within the parameters of what's acceptable to our society, we should just do our best to have the fewest guns so that, to your point, we don't know when someone will become depressed, when someone who becomes depressed will be at the point that they will think about ending their life. And so the thing that we really want to do is just make sure that there isn't something in their vicinity that could be used to end their life at that time to buy precious moments so that they can seek help. And also, one quick point, most suicidal crises are really fleeting. If you look at the point of, um, of real danger, it's sometimes minutes, you know, maybe half an hour. Uh, and, and having dealt with so many situations where you can see if the person could just have had a, a moment to think about the situation, reconsider, that, that's sometimes all that's needed. And having a firearm there is an interruption to that that is fatal in many cases. And so was the car uh, when they wanted to commit suicide by asphyxiation. Um, and so are many other means. What, what I am saying is that uh, I think that uh, uh, clip capacity, uh, reducing clip capacity wouldn't stop a person from taking a three out three and shooting himself. It would only take one bullet. I mean, what I'm saying is a lot of these uh, uh, proposals in this bill wouldn't, wouldn't help the potential suicide. That's that. That's my that's my concern with uh, with your observation, sir. And so I'll I'll end it at that. Thank you. Merci beaucoup, Senator Richards. Senator Plitt. Thank you, Senator Plitt, Followed by Senator Dasko. Here, my question also is, Mr. Senior, uh, and I'm going to follow up on what Senator Richards said. Uh, first of all, if we would take all cars off the street, we would have no car accidents. Um, but my question is, as it relates to the study, um, uh, is uh, um, your, your study or your, your comment on comparing suicide by firearm in Toronto with the five largest metropolitan areas in the United States, something you co-authored with several colleagues back in 2019. And that study found that suicide rates by firearms were highest in centers where there was a high prevalence of firearms in such centers. And although Toronto had the highest rate of suicides by means other than firearms, uh, I think you would argue that the presence of firearms makes it more likely, which you already did. Uh, this is interesting, but you need to consider this in the context of the bill, because that's what we're talking about here is Bill C-21. Uh, this bill does not actually reduce legal firearms in circulation in Canada. The bill will certainly ban the purchase of and sale of legal handguns, but it doesn't actually take any handguns out of circulation, at least not until someone dies, then per that, uh, the state loses that handgun. And of course, nothing prevents handgun owners or anyone else from owning or buying another firearm. The bill also confirms a ban on so-called assault rifles, but it doesn't reduce any other firearms in circulation, including semi-automatic firearms. In fact, the government will actually pay gun owners to hand in the firearms that have been prohibited and then permits those firearms owners to use that money to go out and simply buy other firearms if they choose to do so. So... Uh, sir, in the pre if the presence of firearms is raising the risk that suicides will be successful, then what impact will this bill, Bill C-21, have when it is actually not reducing the legal firearms that are now in circulation? Thank you, Specifically, Senator. Specifically, Bill C-21. Yes, thank you. 
I, I think um, there are different ways to answer the question. I mean, first, I might quibble very slightly with the beginning of what you said about cars versus um, firearms. Actually, that was one of the major findings that um, when cars were de detoxified in the 1990s, it had a dramatic impact. It's much harder these days to end a person's life with a car than it used to be in the past. Um, and the rates of it are very, very low. A uh, handful of people who do it every year in, um, in Toronto, whereas um, a firearm is a much easier uh, uh, Well, sir, easier let me interject access. for one second. Yeah. I didn't say people were killing them, uh, suicides by car accident. I I said simply, if there was no car on the streets, there would be no car accidents, period. Oh, that's true. Uh, f fair. It's a fair point. And I guess part of the, what you have to decide is, do we need cars and do we need firearms? The answer to those questions may differ. But I, I, w what I will agree with you on is that, um, you know, uh, essentially, I think any effort to reduce uh, either access or availability to firearms is going to be the most effective strategy in reducing suicide. For example, to the previous senator's last comment about clip uh, numbers, I imagine that could be very helpful for uh, homicide prevention or mass homicide prevention. I don't believe that that specific uh, finding will will impact suicide. So uh, you kind of have to decide which elements of the bill might work for different elements of harm that are caused by firearms. But the bill doesn't take any guns off the street. So that would be better. I would I, Certainly from a suicide prevention standpoint, it would be good to do more of that. Yeah, fair enough. But then we need something other than Bill C-21. We're dealing with Bill C-21. It does not do what you're suggesting you would like done. That is my point. Not that I fully support we should do anything we can to, to, to prevent people from committing suicide. There's, there's no argument. Uh, the argument that I have is Bill C-21 doesn't do that, uh, so uh, why don't we find a different mechanism than this, because this isn't the answer to what you're suggesting. Senator Dasko. Thank you, Chair, and thank you to our witnesses for being here. Um, my question is for Dr. Sinyar as well, and um, thank you very much for your work and also being a Torontonian, I very, very much value the uh, presence of Sunnybrook Health Sciences in my community. It's a, it's a great institution, and I'm very pleased that you're associated with it. So, um, so your theory, you are a population specialist in population suicide issues and prevention. And um, I just wanted to, uh, and, and your, your theory, and uh, based on data, is that there is, uh, by reducing the means for suicide, then uh, guns being one of them, then, uh, then, there, then we can look forward to lower, lower suicide uh, rates. Now, um, uh, let, me, uh, let me just uh, ask a couple of questions. First of all, I guess a little bit related to what Senator Pledge has asked you, but um, with respect to the bill uh, and your understanding of it, should there be greater restrictions on firearms um, from what we are, are contemplating in this bill? So would that help suicide rates if we actually had greater restrictions in C-21? Uh, and secondly, help me understand something that has come up a couple of times in this committee. And then w with respect to availability, some people have said, okay, every household has knives. So um, why is it or is it the case that people don't try to commit suicide with knives? Or perhaps they do. I'm just... I want to explore that uh, that issue, that topic, for a moment, just to understand that. And then, thirdly, with respect to your comments about suicide being impulsive, there being transitory factors that many people have, uh, is it the fact that most people who commit suicide try it once and then don't try it again? So do you have data on that? So anyway, a lot of questions for you, and um, thank you very much. Sure. Thank you, Senator. And it is truly an honor to work at Sunnybrook. Um, in terms of the bill, I guess what I would say is there are three different um, ways that 
um, firearms could cause harm. One is uh, an unintentional injury and two intentional versions, homicide and suicide. And so there will probably be, there should be elements of any bill on, on firearms to deal with all three of those issues. But to your specific question, absolutely, it would be helpful to uh, anything that would just reduce the number of firearms. Um, uh, if we could be adding that to the bill would help in reducing suicides across Canada. And that goes to the second question you ask about knives. Um, people do try to end their lives uh, with knives. We see them clinically in the hospital sometimes. Um, it's a much harder way to end a person's life. And most frequently, the action is non-fatal. And then someone will show up to the eMERGE and it offers us an opportunity to intervene, which is very rare. I can think and you know, off the top of my head of dozens of cases of people who have uh, used a knife to try to end their life who I've seen in the hospital. I can think of no cases of firearms uh, because they're so lethal. Um, and and um, in terms of your question about uh, time, number of attempts, it's, a, it's, it's variable. It is true that the majority of people who die by suicide do so on their first attempt. Um, it's roughly 50-50, but a bit more on the first attempt. And so what you really want is whatever that first attempt to be non-lethal so that it gets someone into, uh, you know, into attention and to care and so that an intervention can be done. Thank you. Before we start our second round, I have a question for Madame Beja. Sorry, uh, Miss Leona, criminologist like saying we always need to look on statistics on murders for eight to ten years to arrive at valid conclusions and sometimes episodes are uh, incidents are episodic like from gangs should we avoid rapid findings or things that could be led by emotion particularly when it's time to modify our regulations? That's a good question. Yes, indeed. That is why we would like to see how this bill can help us better assess what is being done. In this case, firearms are circulating in Canada. Some will say they are legal firearms, and we're trying to get uh, data on that throughout the country. Others will say that there's a mix between legal and illegal weapons. For example, you have the RCMP that has its tracking center that is trying to show that we are never able to identify some firearms available. In this context, We are there to support our justice partners as a national statistics center. We also have a national mandate to look at what we have available in the community. <clears throat> so this bill could help us come up with better standards. So when it comes to legal or illegal weapons in Canada, well, there we will be we can be able to inform bills we will begin with uh, senator boivenu followed by senator youssef and followed by senator richards my question goes to statistics canada do you have any comparative studies amongst people between 16 and 24 years when it comes to the use of firearms when a crime is committed? Do you have comparative data between the use of shotguns and the use of uh, sh shotguns and the use of rifles? Thank you, uh, Senator Boavino. That's a very good question. I think we are looking at a detailed study of firearms and the profile of holders of those firearms. So we can give you more information with the age groups. It's not the same thing for adults and juveniles. 
But the statistics you provided a while ago are very disturbing. When we look at those between 16 and 18, where the percentage of increase for crime with firearms exceed all the other categories. And when a crime is committed by a minor, particularly in Quebec, and when they become a major or an adult and commit another crime, the previous data uh, is uh, deleted from the system. But the bill we have before us, C21, is based on the rise in crime. But if this increase in crime can be accounted for only by minors between 16 and 18, it's not the same for adults. We need social programs to accompany them. Don't you believe that's the case? Even that's... That's the way Minister LeBlanc started discussions. A week after he came here, the minister said that C21 will have little impact on organized crimes. See, it will have greater impact on minors who buy firearms from the streets and commit crimes. What impact will this crime, will this uh, uh, bill have on minors? I don't believe we are in a position to to respond to that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Boisvenu. Senator Youssef, followed by Senator Richards. Back, uh, Ms. Leonard and Ms. Bijan, in regard to the, question, the answer you were providing on the pilot you were doing, I didn't get the conclusion of that. So um, I'm very interested in terms of how this pilot might help us collect better data that can help the understanding, of course, uh, gun crimes across the country. Uh, yes, actually, and, and this pilot that was started in 2018, uh, it, it is at the stage of data collection, uh, and this work was done with the recommendation and endorsed by the Canadian Association of Chief of Police, which is basically uh, to add new variable to the UCR, the Uniform Crime Report Survey, to better capture farm characteristics that were not there before. So it started in sort of 2019, but that's why this pilot now will receive money with public safety for the next five years to uh, do this data collection around farm characteristic, count the number of uh, firearms that are either seized, recovered, or stolen as part of a criminal incident, and their origin. So this work uh, with public safety and adding those new variables in the existing uniform crime reporting survey uh, from all police services on those police reported criminal incident uh, will ensure or at least advance more consistency in firearm-related definition across police services in Canada. So in the, in the context of StatScan, when can we start getting this new data that will better inform us about the granularity of, you know, how and which guns, legal or uh, legal, and more importantly, um, that can be of much help in regard to understanding the crimes and, 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 and firearms-related uh, use? Well, we're working with the uh, Canadian Association of Chief of Police Special Purpose Committee mm -hmm. and the Police Information Statistic Committee uh, and the Special Purpose Committee members were here to uh, do their representation as well. We're looking at data collection next year and uh, so most likely 2025. But again, uh, given the situation, we, we can always see if some, uh, let's say, uh, preliminary findings, data around advancing uh, this data collection, especially on the origin of uh, firearms in Canada, and uh, to better capture those incidents as well as we move in with the, uh, the training uh, uh, and some of the challenges, though, that have been raised on this, uh, you know, on this committee in terms of even police and prosecutor not understanding sometimes the laws. And that, too, is a challenge in terms of capturing the information uh, in a valid manner as well in all of these files for police officer and even prosecutor as well. So training is important for well capturing the data quality and validity of this information that's, uh, that's new for everyone. Merci beaucoup. Alors, en conclusion. Thank you. In conclusion, Senator Richards. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm going back to the uh, psychiatrist again, please. Um, I, and I'm not trying to beat up on you or anything. Um, my uh, children were at Sunnybrook Hospital. We took them there when I lived in Toronto. 
But there was a bridge across Bloor Street near the Don Valley, which uh, had a number of suicides when I was there. And there was a bridge on the Miramichi that had a number of suicides as well. My only thing about this regulation is you cannot determine action or reaction of human nature through governmental legislation. And so I'm very, I am very concerned with this positive attitude toward this, which is really, really going to uh, have a negative impact, I think, sooner or later on ordinary people who have rifles for, for target shooting or hunting. And I think it's, uh, it's a targeting of them and not solving the problem. So perhaps maybe you could uh, comment on that, sir. Thank you so much, uh, Senator. And don't worry, I don't, I don't feel that. But, but um, I, I, I um, so in term, I think actually the answer to your question might be what you raised with the Blur Viaduct. That's actually my research. Um, that was the study that I was mentioning in my opening remarks. Um, originally, it appeared that the barrier didn't change suicide rates because of increases at other places. Um, and uh, I later did some research which identified that the media in uh, in Canada, like the Globe and Mail had an article two months after the barrier came up, uh, identifying other bridges that people could jump from. Um, and that was a huge violation of um, media guidelines, although at the time we didn't actually have any in Canada. And it's why I spend most of my career these days actually working on public messaging, although I also do means restriction and, and other kinds of suicide prevention. Um, but if you once the media stopped talking about it, the more recent literature really shows that in an enduring way over the course of decades, that barrier does appear to have lowered suicide rates by about the 10 people who had uh, died at that location. Uh, there was a transient um, finding that it, that it didn't initially, probably due to a media effect. But um, even that was the poster for means restriction doesn't work, and in the long run, it one one last one one last question, sir. Uh, do you um, own a firearm, or, or know people who own firearms? I mean, do you have you spoken to people who actually use them for recreational or hunting, and have I, uh, I, have used them safely? Because because as I said, ninety five percent of the people I I know are extremely conscientious people when it comes to firearms. They were taught from the time they were children to be so. So that may be so. It's just that even if you're conscientious, if you're in a suicidal crisis, it may override the conscientiousness. But to answer the specific question, I do not own a firearm. I do know many people, actually, who own firearms, although most of them are, are American colleagues. Thank you. Uh, Before we move on to this next panel, I would like to make a comment. I was a police officer for 40 years. For 25 of those years I was on the road, I had to cover lots of suicide calls where people did not have firearms. This was suicide by hanging. And unfortunately, I had to answer some of those calls. And sometimes where there were firearms, people had used firearms. I'll spare you the details. My best friend, who was a police officer, I was the one who found him with a pistol in his mouth. So unfortunately, there's lots of suicides amongst police officers, and they use their firearms. I don't have statistics. I'm not a professional. But thanks to my career, most of the suicide cases that I covered involving firearms, well, I somewhat agree that it's a form of suicide that is done rapidly. Unfortunately, people don't talk about it. My best friend who committed suicide is someone I found with a firearm in his mouth. So unfortunately, police officers use their service arms. I'm not a professional. I'm simply telling you what I observed. Now, this takes us to the end of our panel. I would like to thank Dr. Senor, Madam Bechin, and Madam Leonard. We appreciate your contributions and the time you took to come and share your experiences with us. Right now, we'll suspend the session briefly, and we will prepare to start our second panel. For those uh, who are just tuning in, we are studying Bill C-21, an act concerning firearms. We now welcome from the Fur Institute of Canada, Mr. Doug Chasson, Director General. Thank, be, you're welcome. Um, and we are happy to have you with us. You have five minutes for your uh, statement. Now, Mr. Chiasson, please proceed when you are ready. 
Good afternoon, Senators. Uh, my name is Doug Chesson. I'm the Executive Director of the Fur Institute of Canada. The Fur Institute of Canada, created by Canada's wildlife ministers in 1983, is the national voice for Canada's fur sector. Responsible for Canada's trap testing and certification program in accordance with the Agreement on International Humane Trapping Standards, the Institute advocates for a sustainable, well-managed fur sector and fur bearer conservation on behalf of Canada's 50,000 trappers. The FIC's work supports not only the commercial fur trade, but wildlife research, predator management, human wildlife conflict work, and livestock protection. Thank you very much for the opportunity to speak before you today on this important piece of legislation. Bill C-21, regardless of whatever good intentions may be behind it, will have dire impacts on Canada's trappers if passed in its current form. The important role of handguns in trapping was recognized explicitly by the government of the day in the authorizations to carry restricted firearms and certain handguns regulations. Trappers are identified explicitly in Section 3C of the regulations as individuals who need restricted firearms or prohibited handguns for use in connection with his or her lawful profession or occupation. Unfortunately, many trappers have not been able to access ATCs due to uh, red tape and Byzantine regulations. This situation leaves trappers at an increased risk without the necessary, necessary safety equipment for their work. Trappers use handguns and other restricted firearms for two primary purposes, humane dispatch of trapped animals and for self-defense from large predators. For many trappers who use restraining traps, a handgun chambered in a small rimfire caliber like 22 long rifle is an ideal tool to provide a quick and humane death while minimizing damage to the fur of a trapped animal. As well, bears, mountain lions and wolves are all large predators which regularly are attracted to trappers setting or checking their traps. As trappers often have their hands full with dead animals, lures or other attractants, while handling traps, tools and other items, a handgun worn on their person can be much more easily carried and quickly brought to bear for defense than a long gun. A trapper hunting in a predator-heavy area may be inclined to carry both a 22 for dispatch and a larger caliber handgun for self-defense. Carrying two long guns, in addition to the other tools of the trade, is not a workable solution for trappers in the bush. Therefore, Bill C-21 will put certain trappers in the position of having to choose between their own safety and maintaining the value of the fur they've harvested. C-21 centralization of the issuance of authorizations to carry with the Commissioner of Firearms has the potential to slow an already slow process to a near halt. Disconnects between the timelines for issuance of provincial trapping licenses and issuance of ATCs already create situations where trappers are unable to obtain ATCs for the start of the trapping season. Further centralizing this process will functionally eliminate the ability for trappers to obtain ATCs in a timely manner. The committees heard testimony from firearms businesses who report extreme challenges in dealing with the Canadian firearms program, including repeated phone outages. Adding another task to the CFP's plate will make the service provided even worse. We recommend that Clause 28 be removed from the bill to leave ATCs in the hands of the chief firearms officers. If the committee is intent on centralizing the issuance power for ATCs, we would request that the legislation be amended to establish service standards that are aligned with provincial licensing. These standards must also have meaningful teeth to provide accountability. As you've heard from many other witnesses, Bill C-21 in its current form would significantly decrease the number of people eligible to purchase handguns, which will lead to a decrease of availability in the firearms retail space and corresponding increases in price. We are already seeing this with the closure of many firearms and outdoor retailers. This will add to the financial burden on trappers who are already suffering from the impacts of a sagging international fur market, inflation and increased cost of living. A new trapper already needs to pay for a trapping course, a trapping license, an RPAL course, RPAL license fees, all before applying for an ATC, which may or may not come in time for the start of trapping season. Given that trappers primarily live in rural and remote communities, further restricted retail presence could add hundreds of kilometers of travel to procure a firearm or an, R uh, an RPAL course. Increasing the costs of any of these constituent pieces will put trapping even further out of reach, particularly for low-income and Indigenous in individuals in communities where this can be one of the few reliable sources of income. 
these fundamental flaws must be addressed before C21 is passed into law. Amendments are necessary. Trappers, both indigenous and non-indigenous, deserve to be safe while pursuing their livelihood. Lastly, and I want to be clear, the passage of C21 as it stands will make trappers in Canada less safe in the pursuit of their outdoor heritage, culture, and livelihoods. Thank you. Thank you so much, Mr. Chiasson. Now we will now proceed to question. Our panel today finishes at 1.30 p.m. As with the last panel, I will limit each question, including the answer, to four minutes, and I will hold out this card to indicate that 30 seconds remain in your time. Now, please keep your questions succinct. And we will proceed to the question with the Senator Plett, followed by Senator Bean, Senator Boisvenu, and Senator Deacon, Ontario. Thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for being here, and thank you for your testimony. Uh, when the minister appeared before our committee, he stated, and I quote, we engaged with firearms community and sports persons across Canada to hear their perspectives and to ensure that we respect their traditions and way of life. Their consultations have informed our path forward. Was your organization, your association, consulted on this bill before it was introduced? No, we were not. Thank you. How many trappers across Canada are impacted by this bill? How many of your members would you say are Indigenous? So in, in real terms, in terms of the number of, of authorizations to carry that are issued right now, that are active, there's 200 ATCs that are issued under, under 3C of the regulations for, uh, for trappers, and 252 ATCs, active authorizations to carry, issued under 3A, which is for individuals uh, in, in areas where wildlife may, may present uh, a risk to, to safety. Uh, and it's, it's difficult to parse how many of those 3A authorizations are issued to trappers. How long is the wait to get an ATC issued for a trapper? Uh, reliable numbers on, on the wait for ATCs, particularly for trappers, uh, are, are hard to come by, as, uh, as you, may, uh, you may sympathize, Senator. Uh, one thing that, that I can say is that there are certain provinces in which uh, the chief firearms officers avail themselves of, of the uh, wide latitude that CFOs have and choose not to issue authorizations to carry two trappers. What would you uh, argue is a reasonable service standard in this regard? I think the, the ideal number would be, uh, the ideal service standard would be ensuring that the ATCs would be issued before provincial trapping seasons open. So if, if, the, uh, if the Canadian Firearms Program came back and said we can, we can get them, uh, we can do them in five months, that would be great. We can inform members that to get your ATCs you need five months. You need to have your application in five months ahead of time. Uh, but, you know, certainly the shorter the better uh, in, in terms of, of a reasonable service standard. The, um, the bill will incrementally close shooting ranges in Canada and in general. It will create an environment where it will become more difficult to safely require handguns. But closing shooting ranges in, in Canada, uh, how would that impact trappers if they cannot uh, go and... and you know, you don't really want to uh, have a person out there with a handgun that uh, can hit the hind leg of a fox that he has trapped instead of the head. It it absolutely would would affect trappers both uh, both in in being able to provide a a quick and humane kill to an animal that's in a restraining trap, uh, and also being able to effectively defend themselves. If trappers aren't comfortable using their weapon or not experienced using using a firearm. Uh, using their particular firearm, uh, that's, uh, that's certainly less than ideal situation. And for, for certain provinces where there is a requirement to complete uh, annual or, or regular firearms training with a handgun in order to receive an AT, to receive a provincial, uh, provincial permission to use that handgun in, in pursuit of trapping, uh, closing of, of shooting ranges would make that much more difficult to obtain. Thank you. I must so be running close to my time. 
Yeah, sure. You have uh, two seconds. <laughs> oh. <laughs> well, I'll use those two seconds to say thank you. Okay. Thank you, Senator Platt. Now we follow with Senator Beam, followed by Senator Boisvenu. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Mr. Chason, for being with us uh, today. Uh, your, um, your brief and your um, statement was, uh, was very clear. And I'm going to follow a little bit in, uh, in the direction where Senator Platt was a moment ago. And, uh, and that is on the, uh, the issue of um, humanely killing uh, trapped animals. In your remarks, you mentioned this is usually done with a, with a handgun and sometimes with a 22 uh, short, uh, short rifle. Uh, I used to have one, uh, one of those, and it's still a bit of an ungainly uh, weapon if you're pulling it out as you're trying to get a wounded animal uh, out of a trap or dispatch it in, in some way. And my question is very simple. Um, for trappers, is there any alternative other than the handgun or, uh, or a 22 to dispatch an animal? So certainly, uh, thank you, Senator, for, for the question. Certainly some trappers do use long rifles, um, for, particularly for, for uh, trappers who aren't necessarily in the, the thickest of bush while they're doing their trapping, trappers that are operating, say, in, in open country in the prairies uh, or trapping field edges, they, they do use uh, long rifles. But there's no other uh, other alternative that would be an easy e easy method. There there certainly are are other potential ways to to provide for for safe and humane dispatch. But the uh, the option that provides the safest environment for a trapper is to be able to stay at a reasonable distance and use a firearm. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Beam. Senator Boisvenu, followed by Senator Deacon, Ontario. Merci beaucoup, Monsieur le Président. Alors, euh Thank you, Chair. Mr. Chasson, welcome to the Senate. I did trapping for about 20 years. My father-in-law taught me that when I was in a BTB. I would like you to talk about safety, the safety of the trappers, because we know that people usually do this alone in the forest with no means of communication. This is done usually in winter, difficult conditions. So sometimes the trappers can get lost. So I'd like you to tell us how this bill could impact the safety of trappers and the new generation of trappers. We know that there are many professional trappers. We also have weekend trappers because of the leisure permits they have to engage in this very in this activity that is loved in Quebec. So how will this affect the safety of trappers and younger trappers? Because we need a new generation of hunters and trappers. That's a real problem in Canada. Thank you very much, Mr. Senator. That's a very important point. And thank you for this opportunity to talk about this. Trappers, as you have said, are people who are doing something that involves a risk to their safety. Trappers are generally alone in the woods. In remote areas and they work they are working with animals, wild animals animals that have uh, teeth and claws and also other animals like uh, bears that constitute a significant risk for their work. So we see about 200 trappers with licenses and some 250. I talk a lot about trappers who say I had a shotgun. I'm a boy. I had a handgun, but um, we need to fill out forms, we need to take trainings, and so on. The rules are changing. 
the licenses and permits that never arrive. Sometimes they come when I'm not available. So many trappers have already made terrible decisions. Some of them have decided that I will either choose my safety or the opportunity to pursue something that is important for me, which is trapping. Also, trappers are managers. These are people that manage a territory, square kilometers, and they have quarters provided by government programs. And they also work with road safety concerns. There are lots of access roads leading to cottages that will not be accessible because of beavers, which cause a lot of damage. Will this have an impact when it comes to the new generation of trappers? That's my concern. Thank you, Senator Boisvenu. But you could answer in writing, Mr. Chasson. Second round? During the second round. Senator D. can be by the Senator Richards. Thank you. And thank you, Mr. Chasson, for being here today. Uh, your position is a pretty specific niche in this whole area when we look at uh, C21. We've heard a little bit uh, about trapping from a previous witness, but not too much. So in an effort to prepare, in an effort to do our homework and meet folks where they're at, we have to go to the woods. And so I'm thinking about that today uh, from the handgun perspective. And I'm going to go through an example, in particular about something that we uh, read recently. So um, I'm looking at the effectiveness, the true effectiveness of a handgun uh, for a grizzly bear, for example, that was attacking you. You're out trapping, and this is here you are, and uh, you have a handgun. I saw one blog post from an outdoor equipment company that said, only if you're lucky will this handgun help you. And the quote was, since your bullet must stop in its tracks, um, you must hit it in the spine to render it immobile. Didn't know that. And if you're exceedingly lucky, if you put a bullet between the eyes or in the brain, you might be successful. But anything else, like in the heart, the chest, they'll still have an adrenaline surge and you could be in trouble. So I bring this up because I do, I, I see your request about Clause 23, and I do think when we look at amendments, we have to look at them pretty, pretty comprehensively. So I worry about people carrying these weapons for self-defense when uh, statistically they are so much more likely to injure themselves or others or loved ones instead of an accident with a firearm. So if we're going to consider voting to amend this bill, we want to know about these exceptions regarding handguns. If you could provide the committee with any data around the stats about trappers that use a handgun specifically to fend off an attacking animal, some may not be here to tell the tale, but you must you know, have some data rather than the types of firearms that would be permitted. I'd kind of like to know what these numbers are. Yeah, right. So, so, Senator, this is actually something that I've, I've worked to try and, and procure before this meeting. Uh, the the reality being is there there isn't much in the way of, of centralized reporting mm -hmm. for avoided conflict. Right. Uh, this this is something that certainly <laughs> provincial provincial natural resource departments or forestry departments mm -hmm. uh, would have some degree of data on uh, fatalities, mm -hmm. but not necessarily on a uh, not necessarily a situation where a trapper or hunter or backwoods surveyor. Uh, used a firearm in self-defense mm -hmm. where it didn't it didn't trigger some other reporting requirement. Mm -hmm. So you know it's certainly uh, less less relevant to to trappers, but you know a defense kill of a polar bear in Nunavut mm -hmm. requires very particular reporting mm -hmm. to the Department of Environment in Nunavut. Um, a killing of, of a grizzly bear in particular would require very significant reporting, but using a firearm to defend oneself against a pack of coyotes or a particularly angry lynx or mm -hmm. a black bear uh, where the, the, the bear thought better of the encounter after being engaged with, with a firearm, um, I'm not aware of any provinces that actually require reporting that incident. Thank you. Do I, Mr. Chairman, more time? Uh, you have uh, 30 seconds. Thank you so much. 
with the earlier comments, so the data there is scant, it's spread out, there's probably some stories, those pieces, you, but, you all, but you're very clear that this bill as it is and not being amended puts risk uh, yes. on our trappers and you have the data for that. So we certainly have, have plenty of, of trappers in, in our organization and in provincial affiliates that mm -hmm. can speak to their personal experiences mm -hmm. in using their, their handguns in self-defense. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, we continue with Senator Richards, followed by Senator Yusuf. Thank you very much for being here. Um, I, I have problems with this because I think it is an arrogant law and it, it parents people who are every bit as moral and conscientious as the people passing the bill. And I don't think it will help uh, reduce crime. But most of the trappers I know no longer trap. They're, well, there's a lot of them are my age, but even the younger guys didn't take it up. Because it isn't an e easy life, is it? No. I mean, you have, uh, before, even before this draconian measure, you have your, your line, your territory, your traps, and, uh, and an increasingly limited market because of the bad publicity trappi trappers getting, and, uh, and uh, the idea of trapping animals get. Could this be the death knell for a number of trappers you know? I think there, there certainly would be trappers that if, if they're no longer, uh, if, if they find themselves in a position where they're no longer able to feel safe in the backwoods, they will not go. Yeah. Uh, they, they will hang up their traps and, and say this is the end of the line for me. Uh, and, and really that is, that is the key here is that this, this comes down to a, a safety issue for, for trappers. And, and certainly, I don't think that uh, you know we, we've had the the regulations on authorizations to carry on the books for for 20 years, over 20 years now. Um, trappers do not represent you know tens of thousands of firearms on the landscape. They represent a very particular use right. case and a very tightly controlled one, uh, who unfortunately are are going to end up being caught up in, in a much larger issue that's, that's far beyond their control. Yeah. What's the, what's the, what is the market like? How pinched is the market now for fur? So there, there are some, some bright spots uh, on the horizon when it comes to the fur market. Uh, we've seen some, some fairly significant increases in the beaver market in, in recent years. Uh, but compared to the fur market of, of 35 years ago, it's, it certainly is a, a much... Uh, much declined industry, uh, but beyond the uh, beyond the simple dollars and cents of, of the fur trade, you know, trapping is is a very important cultural and heritage right. activity for uh, for people living in remote and rural yeah. communities, both indigenous and non-indigenous. Yeah. Thank you, to Senator Richards, Senator Youssef. Oh, thank you, Chair, and, and, and thank you, Mr. Jones, for being here. Um, one of the things that I'm struck with why that you raise, which is, uh, I guess, uh, requires some reflection, is the time it takes to get an ATC. Um, um, is there generally inconsistency across the country because of how um, permits are issued in, or is it just varies from jurisdiction to jurisdiction that might might be a little bit better in one place but terrible in other places because of staffing issues so so it certainly varies across the country where currently the ATCs are issued by the chief firearms officers there there is variability across provinces and territories and and certainly as as I mentioned earlier there are provinces where you know simply you will not get one um, the the CFOs refuse to issue uh, ATCs for the purposes of, of trapping. And do we know why that is? Uh, I think that would be a very good question for the, the CFOs. I, I, won't, uh, I won't speculate as to their motivations. Okay. Because there's nothing preventing them from doing it. Legally, if you have one, you could renew it and, and it shouldn't be a, a, yes, an yeah. issue. But it, so there's some biases in the system in regard to, to, doing, uh, yes. to doing that. Now, obviously, I, I think you did mention one point, which I just wanted to, to focus on. Um, uh, you are suggesting that five months is a reasonable time frame. So, so I, I used five months purely as a as a, 
I needed a number for my okay. for my right. uh, example. Uh, so okay. thank you for the uh, for the opportunity to clarify. Uh, I think that that the primary concern for for trappers who are currently availing themselves of the ability to obtain an ATC is that regardless of when the the timeline would be, is that in certain provinces they're only receiving their AT they're they're waiting to go out on the trap line and still don't have their ATC in hand. And uh, you know, for in some cases these are, are individuals that have gotten an ATC every year. So they they find themselves in the the uh, deeply unfortunate situation of going, well do I pack the handgun and go to the trapping camp? I know I know by the time I come back it'll be here. Uh, you know, for so I think that that what really would be beneficial would be just setting what the timelines are. Uh, you know, certainly uh, I, I would hope that timeline is not a year, uh, because for for folks that may be renewing trapping licenses, getting new trapping licenses, but it's it's something that I would hope there would be greater collaboration and cooperation between the the CFOs. And the provincial licensing agencies for who issue trapping licenses, and and have them come together and say, well, it takes us X number of months to issue a trapping license. Can you issue an ATC in the same period, uh, or can you make sure that we've issued our trap because you will need your trapping license to get your ATC? To say, if you aren't able to issue trapping licenses before X date we won't have time to issue the ATC before the start of, of trapping season. From your experience, do these folks ever talk to each other? <laughs> I, I don't think they talk to each other as much as we would like. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> it's like the checks in the mail, right? Yeah. That kind of attitude. So, um, listen, I appreciate, uh, um, you know, some of the points that you're making, and, and thank you for sharing them with us. Thank you, Senator. Merci, uh, Senator Youssef. Thank you, Senator Youssef. Before we start second round, since we have some time left, I'll ask a question. Mr. Chasson, I would like to come back to trappers as individuals. What's the proportion of trappers who are from the First Nations? Do you think that indigenous trappers will be favored by the provisions of C-21 when we talk about safety and the possibility of carrying their weapons? We have about 50,000 trappers throughout Canada. About 50% of them are indigenous trappers. It's a bit difficult to put a specific figure on that because we have some jurisdictions where indigenous trappers do not have licenses we don't have a spreadsheet with exact numbers, but we think that about 25,000 trappers in Canada are indigenous. I do not think that indigenous trappers will be favored by Bill C-21. I would say that many of the problems we have seen as trappers are problems that concern all trappers, not necessarily indigenous trappers. Thank you very much. We shall continue with our second round of questions. Senator Boisvenu. Thank you, Chair. I'll try to follow up with my ideas. I'll continue with the same topic as before. As I said a while ago, trappers are at the heart of the management of wildlife in Canada, and trapping is mostly done on Crown lands. And this is land that is used for forestry, hunting, and fishing. And trappers have some kind of responsibility to secure the land. So what's the impact of this bill on the young people, which, is, which are already threatened? Will this worsen the drop in trappers in Canada to the extent where it's the government that will have to take responsibility over those territories. It's a problem that we foresee, foresee 
if we see the changes that we see in the bill being implemented and in combination with the concerns that Senator Richards mentioned a while ago. Now, uh, the numbers of trappers is stable, but it's changing. Well, it will change in the future. If this bill if there were an amendment that you could accept, which one will it be? More importantly, an amendment of Article 28. So that ATCs not be centralized with the Canadian Firearms Program. And this responsibility should stay with the provincial arms uh, controllers. And if this authority is centralized, we would like to see service standards be the same and indicated in the bill. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Boisvenier. Today's meeting. I'd like to extend your, our sincere thanks to Mr. Chiasson. We greatly appreciate your contributions and the time you took to share your insight with us. Uh, our next meeting will be Monday, the 27th of November at 3 Eastern Time, 3 p.m., 3 Eastern Time. At C128, we'll be starting close by close study of the bill. Contact uh, the Office of the Law Clerk and Parliamentary Council should they wish to bring forward amendments and to share the amendments with the clerk as soon as possible. Si vous souhaitez que vos amendements soient regroupés. If you want your amendments to be collated and distributed before the meeting, please communicate with the clerk latest Friday morning. Otherwise, bring enough copies of your amendments to the meeting of the 30th. On that note, I wish you a wonderful day. Thank you so much. Perfect.